Larry Lessig is a professor of law at the Harvard School of Law. That does not tell you nearly enough about Larry Lessig. He is an expert in governance, in intellectual property, in ethics, and while his presentation will be focused on the United States of America, my apologies to my colleagues and friends from overseas, the real focus of his presentation and passion is on representative democracy. So if you happen to think that representative democracy is a good thing, then you'll be interested in Larry Lessig. The other thing that is so meaningful to us is we had an unfortunate situation about this happens when you plan events. Three weeks ago, we had a cancellation of a keynoter. Good reasons, no problem, big problem for us. We understand, we had a hole on the program. My sister Stephanie Walcott, whom you'll meet later, sent an email out and with 12 hours, without asking, what do you need, Larry emailed back and said, I'll be there. With that, Larry Lessig. Thanks. So about a year and a half ago, uh, we lost my friend Aaron Swartz to suicide. And since that time, I've been throwing myself off of tall buildings with no guarantee that there was anything at the bottom. Aaron Swartz had been a friend, a collaborator, a co-conspirator. He was one of the few people I think of as a genius that I had known. And for his whole life, all 26 years of his life, his focus had been on this single idea, how do we make the world better, according at least to the way he thought the world should be made better. There's a film coming out in, a, in the fall called The Internet's Own Boy about his extraordinary life. <clears throat> but he brought his life to an end after suffering two years of a federal prosecution for the outrageous act of downloading too many academic articles that he wanted to make available to the third world. Now, seven years before his death, Aaron had come to me and asked me a question. At the time, I was doing work on intellectual property and on the internet, and I was preparing for my first TED talk. I was proud of what I was doing. And he said to me, how are you ever going to achieve what you're trying to achieve in the area of intellectual property or uh, internet regulation? How are you ever going to do this, given the deep corruption that defines the way our government works? Now, but corruption, he wasn't talking about Rob Lagojevich corruption or Randy Duke Cunningham corruption. He wasn't talking about criminal acts. He was talking about what we all recognize about the way our government doesn't work. The corruption in the way that money drives politics. So I was a little disappointed he wasn't excited in what I was doing, and I looked at him and I said, you know, Aaron, that's just not my field. Not my field. And he said, I get it, as an academic, it's not your field. Is that what you mean? And I said, yes, as an academic. He said, but okay, as a citizen, is it your field? And this is the way Aaron was. He wouldn't say he would ask, but his questions were as clear as a child's hug. And his question forced me to confront what's something I knew deep in my heart, and it changed me. It changed my work. And in the seven years since that question, I've given maybe 500 talks across the world trying to focus people on what at the core of our democracy was rotten. But as it came up on the anniversary of Aaron's death, I was keen to find a less sterile, less academic way to talk about, to bring about something related to what he tried to get me to do. We've been focused on New Hampshire. 
which of course will be the key to the 2016 presidential campaign. We've been organizing with people in New Hampshire about how do we get people in New Hampshire to get the candidates in New Hampshire to talk about, to focus on this fundamental question. There have been a group started called the New Hampshire Rebellion. Rebelling not against the government, but against the politicians. Trying to get the politicians to talk about what they never want to talk about because they're too embarrassed to talk about it. The constant focus they have on the single objective they've got to raise the money they need to get to office. So New Hampshire had another incredibly inspiring soul, a woman named Granny D, Doris Haddock, who 15 years ago, at the age of 88, had started a walk. She started in Los Angeles and walked to Washington, D.C. with a sign on her chest that said, Campaign Finance Reform. It took her 18 months. 3,200 miles, she arrived at the age of 90. When she arrived, of course, there were hundreds of people who had joined her, a whole bunch of congressmen who had gotten in cars and driven out about a mile out before she came in. <laughs> <clears throat> to celebrate this incredible act she had done for this cause, which 15 years ago, the world was just beginning to wake up to. Now, I didn't have 18 months, to walk across the country, and I got three kids who hate to walk anyway, so I wasn't gonna take that kind of time. But the question I had was, was there a way to remix Granny D with the inspiration in honor of Aaron Swartz? And so on October 30th, 2013, I took my first great leap from a tall building. 75 days before Aaron's anniversary, I post posted on my blog this question. Will you help us organize a walk across New Hampshire in January? We wanted to walk 185 miles across the strait. Did I tell you in January? In January. We're going to begin in Dixville Notch, the place the primary happens and go 185 miles down to Nashua. <clears throat> now, when I took this leap, my expectation was two or three other people would join me. It would be this kind of crazy people's walk across the state. It was a crazy person's walk. Don't, don't get me wrong. I'm completely confessing the insanity in what we did. But it was a walk, I thought, which would be a tiny effort to celebrate, to memorialize, to remind. But what happened was extraordinary. <clears throat> More than 200 people participated in this walk. 25 of us did every single mile across the state. And as we did this walk, we learned something. I learned something. It was a religious experience for me, the academic, understand the issue I had been talking about for 70 years. Because what we knew about this issue was that basically people got it. In a poll we'd done at the end of last year, we found 96% of Americans, 96% thought it important to reduce the influence of money in politics. But most politicians, most pundits, said people don't care about this issue. And the reason they don't care is revealed in another statistic we had uncovered. Though 96% thought it was important to reduce the influence of money in politics, 91% thought it wasn't possible. So this combination, 96 and 91, produces the politics of resignation. Politics of resignation. This is what we want, but we're adults. We know what we can't get, so we don't spend much time fighting for it. So just like 96% of us wish we could fly like Superman, but because 91% of us at least know we can't, we don't leap off of tall buildings. Well, I leap off to tall buildings, but others don't leap off of tall buildings to fly or to try to fly. We accept that reality. But what this experience showed me was that if you could pierce that resignation, if you could give people hope, as Harvey Milk used to say, give them hope that there was a way to do something about this. They exploded with passion. They exploded with a commitment to do something about it. We had people by the second day, everyone in New Hampshire knew what we were doing. People honking their horns, 
racing out of their house in the morning in their pajamas, signs in the front of the road welcoming the Granny D walkers, people so frustrated and angry with the sense that they had lost a democracy and eager to celebrate with us. The idea we could get it back. So we did that walk. We'll walk again in July. We'll walk again this January, this time with many different routes. And we will walk again in 2016 up to the primary, rallying people and that state to make the candidates answer this one question, what will you do to end the system of corruption that we now see in Washington? OK, that's the first time I leapt. And then in March, I leapt again. I was invited back to give a TED talk followed from a TED talk I had given the year before. <clears throat> and in this TED talk, I talked about this problem, this corruption, and the way our government doesn't work. And in the course of it, I described the problem as it relates to the emerging dynamic of super PACs. And I announced at that TED talk that a month later, we were going to launch something called May 1. On May 1, AKA May Day, you know, May Day, the distress call that ships issue to say there's something wrong. We were going to issue a May Day call for this democracy. And what this May Day call would do would be to build a super PAC to end all super PACs. And the idea had been brewing for a while. We had turned to a pretty prominent political consulting firm, and we'd said to them, so how much would it cost to win a Congress in 2016 that was committed to fundamental reform? What's that number? And they went district by district to calculate that number. And they presented it to us. But the critical thing they said is that you need to run a two-cycle campaign, 2016 is the important one, but 2014 is the critical one. And in 2014, you'd have to run a pilot for 2016 to try to wake Congress up to the fact that a monster is on the field. So the question was, how are we going to raise the money for that 2014 project? And I said, well, why don't we kickstart it, or sort of kickstart it. You can't kickstart political thing. But I said, let's kickstart it. Let's raise a certain chunk of it from the bottom up, and then we'll get it matched from the top down. So that by election day 2016, we can win a Congress committed to fundamental reform. And as I prepared that talk, I discovered election day 2016 is the day Aaron Swartz would have turned 30. So we want, by that day, 218 members of the House and 60 members of the Senate to have committed themselves to pass fundamental reform in these two stages, 2014 and 2016. Now, 2014 was going to cost $12 million. So I said at that TED talk, <clears throat> we're going to first kickstart a million dollars in 30 days. And if we meet that, I'll get that amount matched. And then we'll kickstart $5 million in 30 days. And if we meet that, I'll get that matched too. And with that $12 million, we would win in five districts that would teach us how to run a campaign in 2016 and to put the fear of God and the other members of Congress who begin to think, wow, if they come back with the numbers they're talking about in 2016, they could defeat me too. Building this foundation for 2016, 2016, where we would spend an amount that I've been told I'm not allowed to mention, where people would think I'm insane. OK, so 2016 is the ultimate aim. Now, people say, well, you're, you know, this is kind of weird. You're using big money to end big money. A little bit ironic there. <clears throat> to which I say, yeah, well, you know, as Lincoln used to say, we need to embrace the irony. <laughs> Actually, Lincoln never said that. But the point is, <laughs> <laughs> we need to embrace the irony. We as a nation are able to do that. We watch Colbert. We get the irony, and we can embrace it. But there's more than irony here. More than irony, because if you think of the history of our nation, there's a whole series of moments where we have used unjust systems to make us more just. So the 15th Amendment, whites organized so that they can include blacks within the right of people to vote. 
Of course, it took 100 years to make that real, but put that aside. Or in the 19th Amendment, men organized so that they could include, we could include women in the scope of those who are allowed to vote. At each of those moments, you could have said, this is an unjust system. We shouldn't use the tools of an unjust system to bring about justice. But I would have said, use whatever tools you've got to bring about a more just system. So it's ironic. I get it. But it's irony towards producing a more perfect system of justice. And so too here. The framers of our Constitution gave us a system that Madison promised would be, quote, dependent on the people alone. The people, by which he explained in Federalist 57, meant not the rich more than the poor. Not the rich more than the poor. But what we've done is to outsource the funding of campaigns in America to a tiny, I mean really tiny, look how small that is, tiny, tiny number of Americans. Tiny, tiny fraction of the 1%. In my book, uh, Republic Loss, I calculate the number of relevant funders of campaigns in the United States. Relevant meaning the funders who the candidates care about, whose views matter, is no more than 0.05% of America. 0.05% are the people who candidates spend 30 to 70% of their time calling so they can raise the money they need to wage the campaigns they have to wage to win on election day. Now, 0.05% is about 150,000 Americans, which the internet tells me is about the same number of people in the United States named Lester. <laughs> Which is why in my TED talk two years ago, I described the United States as Lester land, Lester land. And after the Supreme Court's decision this year removing aggregate limits on campaign contributions, the number of those relevant funders will go down. And I think no more than maybe 35,000 Americans will be the relevant funders, which turns out to be the same number of people as named Sheldon in the United States. So whether it's Lester Land or Sheldon City, the point to recognize is this is a deep corruption of the system our framers gave us for building and producing representative democracy. Because we are dependent, they are dependent on this tiny fraction. They are not dependent on the people alone. So we turn to the rich. Like the generation of Lincoln turned to the whites, like the generation of the progressives turned to men, and say to them, help us so that we can include all in the scope of those who are relevant funders of elections to build this more perfect union. So on May 1st, we launched this idea. When we did, I was taken aside by many of my friends who said, OK, you've always been kind of insane. This is the insanest thing you've ever done. There is no way you will raise a million dollars. And to make it as hard as we could, there was no promotion. There was no advertising. There was no announcement to the press. We just basically put up a web page, a blog post, and some tweets and emails among friends. And within a day and a half, we had raised $300,000. And then the servers melted. <laughs> so a whole team of volunteer coders, first responder coders, came in and over the weekend built a brand new infrastructure. And on day 13, we crossed the $1 million mark, more than two weeks ahead of schedule. <laughs> and last night, I signed the final agreement to get that $1 million matched. So we now have $2 million in this campaign. And on June 4th, then, we will launch the $5 million in 30 days campaign, which will be matched if we reach that two, or at least that's what I have committed, so that on July 4th, July 4th, Independence Day, we can declare our independence again with the first critical stage along the way to getting back a republic we can trust. Now, my wife looks at me and she says, so why is it you keep on throwing yourself off of these tall buildings? 
you've got these cute kids. You've got a good job. You've got tenure. And, you know, part of the answer to that question is for a shrink if I ever had time to talk to one, but that's not the part that's important here. Part of the answer to that question, though, the important part, is a simple truth, a simple, urgent truth. The truth Aaron convinced me of, the truth you should be convinced of, that unless we find a way to fix this democracy, we face a catastrophic future for our nation. This is not a left-right issue. If you step back and think about all the issues you care about, whether it's health care reform on the left or government bailouts on the right, global warming on the left or a complex tax system on the right, financial reform for the left or financial reform for the right, what you need to recognize is that we will get no sensible change in any of those areas until we change this corruption first. So you need to take the issue you care most fundamentally fundamentally about. Sit down, put it right in front of you, and look it straight in the eyes and tell that issue. For me, it's climate change. For you, it might be health care. Whatever that issue is, look that issue in the eye and explain to it, we will never get this issue solved until we address this fundamental corruption first. So it's not that the corruption is the most important issue. It isn't. Your issue is the most important issue. But it is the first issue, because we will get no sensible reform until we fix it. And we as a nation cannot afford no sensible reform. So I leap off tall buildings. And so should you. Not just because Aaron told me, and now I've told you, but as I've thought about it, I've recognized it's because of who he was, who he is. When Aaron came to convince me that I should change my career, he was just a kid. He had just turned 20. And when I think about what he tried to convince me of, I recognize something every one of us needs to see. That every important issue we argue about Healthcare, climate change, the debt, social security, food safety, food our kids should eat. Every one of these issues is an issue that matters first to our kids. Yeah, we are wrecking the climate, but people like us, it's not going to matter. We'll be gone, but our kids won't. The debt, yeah, it's disastrous, but not for us. For them, they will pay the debt. Healthcare costs, huge proportion of which are consumed by the radically terrible diet, the consequences of that diet, which are driven by idiotic government policies subsidizing all sorts of poisonous food. We won't pay for that. They will pay for that. Every single important issue they will pay for long after we're gone. And when you recognize that, you should recognize that you should leap off of buildings because this is what parents do. Parents do whatever they can to make the future better for them, for our kids. And though we've done a lot of extraordinary things, here's the one thing we need to confront. We have failed them in this respect. We have failed them so far. Now, we still have a chance. There's still a lot that can be done. And maybe it's just a one in a million chance. But my view is, when I look at my kids, and I think of how we have failed them, even if it's one in a million chance, that's enough for me to leap off of tall buildings. Thank you very much.
Perhaps some of us recall a fellow named Cato, a fellow named Julius Caesar. They live, and you're looking at one of them right now, although you're a much more pleasant guy than Cato was, I hear. <laughs> That's not my field. That's not my responsibility is what that means. Now, let's be fair. There are a lot of problems in the world. Each one of us can't solve every one of them on our own. But the question I think Larry confronted was, is this the one for me? What can you do? How do you pierce the resignation? Well, one thing, it seems clear from all of our speakers, is we have to have a big objective. If it's not big, how are you going to stir hearts? And certainly, this crazy objective is big. But he also started with a small piece. He said, how do we phase this? How do we attack something we can possibly achieve? And then we'll move to that objective that is totally impossible, because maybe we might make it happen. It's enough for me to jump off buildings. Now, Larry, you told us you can't tell us that number. I understand confidentiality, and I understand you know, self-respect and all that. But look, I know you can't tell us the number, but could you tell us the number of zeros in the number, maybe? No, no, just, just a joke. By the way, do your math and you can figure out what I was doing. Um, only insanity res inspires. Larry mentioned the word insane. I think that's true. But like Robert Swan, who opened our session for us, I mentioned he's the most insane and brilliant person whom I've ever met. Larry is the other one. And thank you so much. So, as I mentioned before, he came here to tell his story, to help us with our stories. And as much as I would love to be able to provide him with that one with many zeros after it, I can't. But without expecting any payment, I think we can dig deep in the kin, and all the money from the kin comes from you, uh, to provide $5,000 for your objective. And however you would like to use that.